The capital of Tuscany and cradle of the Renaissance, Florence is one of the most beautiful cities of Italy. With its churches, museums, and palaces, this city alone accounts for 25% of the world's artwork. The omnipresence of the Medici family notwithstanding, few areas in the world can brag about having engendered so many artists like Giotto, Michelangelo, and Botticelli. The Ponte Vecchio, or Old Bridge, is a symbol of the city. It crosses through the Arno River at its narrowest point. The first wooden construction dates back to Roman times. Destroyed by the river in 1333, it was rebuilt in stone in 1345. Its originality lies in the fact that it is a pedestrian bridge that still holds shops all along its span. Initially occupied by butchers and tanners, Ferdinand I of Medici could not bear the fetid odors and had them replaced by jewelers. Vasari's corridor above the bridge was added in 1565. Thanks to it, the Medicis could move about without danger, thus without escort, between their palace and the different sites of government, like the Uffizi Gallery located on the Arno River. This old ensemble of offices forms a row lined with two long buildings which meet in a two-story gallery. The Tribuna of the Uffizi is one of the halls that was devoted to exhibiting the artwork of the Medici collection prior to its opening to the public 200 years later. Today, with its 8,000 square meters, the Uffizi Gallery contains the most beautiful collection of Italian paintings and artworks of all the great European Renaissance masters. The first halls exhibit Italian primitives and works from the first Renaissance, like this Virgin with Child by Giotto, painted in 1302 and drawing on Byzantine iconography to humanize the figures represented. This altarpiece of the Annunciation, given by Gabriel to Mary, was designed by Simone Martini in 1333 in Gothic style. Giottino's masterpiece, displayed here, is certainly the Pieta. Painted around 1350, it excels in the representation of feelings. This famous altarpiece by Gentile di Fabriano, representing the Adoration of the Magi, dates back to 1423. The profusion of gold and the lapis lazuli pigment used for the Virgin's coat revealed the international Gothic style which was still very present in the early 15th century. The two portraits of the Duke and Duchess of Urbino, painted by Piero della Francesca around 1480, originally made up a single painting. Using a very sober and geometric style, the artist was a pillar of the Italian Renaissance. The composition of the Santa Lucia altarpiece painted by Domenico Veneziano is characterized by a very studied use of lighting and demonstrates the mastery of perspective. Paintings by the great Renaissance masters like Botticelli's, Primavera can be seen in the gallery's collection. It is an allegorical painting made on wooden panels around 1480. Beside the main character, Venus, Flora, in her delicately flowered dress, is the goddess of spring. Botticelli represented himself on the lower right in his adoration of the Magi. This painting by Domenico Girlandaio represents Saint Zenobius, the patron of Florence, kneeling on the right before the Virgin in Majesty. Foreign painters are also on display. Roger van der Weyden, a primitive Flemish painter, came to Florence in 1450. In this scene of adoration painted in 1504, the German painter Albrecht Dürer rivals the skill of Italian painting in the art of perspective. He represented himself in the form of the youngest of the three magi. The Madonna of the Goldfinch is one of Raphael's early paintings dating from the time of his stay in Florence. Its title is due to the bird represented in the painting. The Uffizi Gallery contains one of the greatest masterpieces of the Renaissance the Venus of Urbino created by Titian in 1538, the peak of sensuality. 
In this hall, the painting that is considered as one of the most representative paintings of Italian mannerism is certainly the Madonna with a Long Neck by Parmigianino. Today, Artemisia Gentileschi is considered as one of the first Baroque painters. She established herself with her artwork at a time when female painters were not easily accepted. In the same period, Andrea del Sarto painted an altarpiece of the Madonna of the Harpies. This woman who watches us without seeing us, who does not reveal her thoughts, was painted by Agnolo Bronzino around 1540. Caravaggio is, of course, on display at the Uffizi, with his Bacchus painted in the late 16th century in his youth. Another work by a young painter, The Annunciation by Leonardo da Vinci, was painted in 1475 when he was 20 years old. It is one of the rare paintings by the Master of Masters that exists today. As can be seen, the Uffizi Gallery is a must-see for art enthusiasts. Just like Florence itself, a destination of choice for those who enjoy history and monuments. This city is the uncontested cradle of the Italian Renaissance, and it is unique in the world. The beauty of the city even seems to be reflected in the surrounding landscape, for the nature here is superb. Mumbai, or Bombay for the Westerners, has 13 million inhabitants. It is the most populated city in the country. It is the commercial capital of India with 25% of its industrial production, 40% of its maritime trade, and 70% of its capital transactions. What's more, Mumbai holds one of the largest movie industries in the world with Bollywood. As a sign of its influence over the Indies, Great Britain wanted to create a new architectural style that would be a fusion of the local Mughal style and the Victorian Neo-Gothic style. It is characterized by buildings of impressive dimensions, made possible by the implementation of technical advances like the use of iron, steel, and concrete. These megastructures were then the support for details and decorations in the local styles favored by the fashion of Orientalism and exoticism. This style spread through India in buildings like city halls, colleges, courts, and stations, like Victoria Terminus here in Bombay. At the origin of the country's first rail network, today it is one of the nerve centers of the megacity. This magnificent building boasts of being one of the most architecturally beautiful railway stations in the world and presents a fusion of Gothic and Indian styles. Its general conception is inspired by models from the end of the Italian Middle Ages, while its stone dome, turrets, and pointed arches call to mind traditional Indian palaces. The station was conceived as the headquarters of the Indian Railway, the center of planning for the still developing network. It was inaugurated in 1887, the Jubilee year celebrating 50 years of the reign of Queen Victoria, also Empress of the Indies. Listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 2004, Victoria Terminus is today one of the most active national rail stations in India. The Gateway of India is an emblematic monument of Bombay. It is situated facing the Arabian Sea, opening the country to the west. 
Erected in the southern part of the city, the gateway is a monumental arch built from yellow basalt by the English between 1915 and 1924 to commemorate the visit of King George V. The architect combined elements of a Roman triumphal arch with the Islamo-Indian style of the 16th century. It was the first structure that visitors saw when arriving in Mumbai. After the Indian Declaration of Independence, the last British soldiers to leave the country passed through here, through the gateway, before disembarking on February 28, 1948. Today, the site is one of the most popular tourist destinations. The Taj Mahal Hotel opened in 1903, 20 years before the gateway to India, which it is facing. Legend has it that the French architect who made the plans for the establishment had to leave quickly as he was unable to withstand the high local temperatures. When he returned, the work was practically finished, except the entrance had been placed on the back of the building. Whatever the case, the Maharajas of Bombay made the hotel an annex of their palaces because the site was open not only to Europeans but to all Indians. The guest books recall the passage of Gandhi, Nehru, Aldous Huxley, Somerset Maugham, and Duke Ellington. And this is where Lord Mountbatten came to declare India's independence. Built by the same architect who designed the gateway to India, the exterior of the Chhatrapati Museum is as interesting as its interior. Built in 1905 to honor the first visit of the Prince of Wales, the monument also symbolizes the perfect union of modern, medieval, and local architecture. The rooms of the museum present varied and rare collections with the theme of India and its culture, objects from the Hindu civilization to sculptures from the different schools of Indian art. There are also painted miniatures and multiple decorative art objects made of precious or semi-precious materials to be found there. In India, a characteristic trait stands out, the religious animal worship with regard to cows. The sacred cow is a Western term. The original Indian term is Goamata, which means mother cow. Indeed, the cow is seen as a universal mother because it gives milk to everyone, even those who are not its offspring. It represents the sacredness of all creatures. Another site facing the business districts of the modern city, the most famous street of the city, Marine Drive, was built in the 1920s on land reclaimed from the sea. Marine Drive is a four kilometer long boulevard. In the shape of a crescent moon, it marries the form of the natural bay, a promenade where residents come to take in the sea air and the sun stretches out parallel to the road. The Mumba Devi Temple is an ancient Hindu temple dedicated to the goddess Mumba, the protector of the city and the patron saint of the salt gatherers and fishers. This temple was built in 1675, then demolished, then rebuilt. Today it is still active and is a place of pilgrimage for the Hindus of the country. Although the poverty is astounding in southern India, and overpopulation is a real problem, the richness of its historical, human, and mystical heritage is truly a revelation. With its capacity to generate exaltation or shivers of joy, this region of the world shows itself to be exceptionally rich in experiences for its visitors. Southern India is stirring, without doubt, to the very depths of every being.
San Miguel de Allende is a fortified city established in the 16th century by the Spanish in order to protect the royal route on which they transported the silver exploited from the mines. It reached its peak in the 18th century. 100 years later, it was the first city in Mexico to have asserted its emancipation from Spanish domination during the country's War of Independence. Today, around 40% of the population is under 15 years old. It is a mix of Mexicans and foreigners, mainly North Americans and Indians. Around the Jardin Principal, or main garden, conceived in the French style, there's the El Choro district, the oldest part of the city. The San Rafael Church is located there, founded in 1742. Its main pseudo-Gothic facade has two levels, arches, pilasters, and a frieze atop the beautiful entrance flanked by two Doric columns. The interior, a sole nave, is embellished by side altars that allude to Calvary, the agony in the crucifixion of Christ. All the characters were created by the local population using a paste made from corn stover. Although the church was pillaged several times throughout the history of Mexico and the majority of its decorations have been lost, the interior retains its original 18th century presentation, with the main altar of the Archangel San Rafael in the rear. Around the square, following the urban standards of the 18th century, the majority of houses have two levels and are decorated with a gallery of arches on the ground floor. Today, these colonial buildings have been converted into shops, restaurants, hotels, or art galleries. With few exceptions, the architecture here is domestic rather than monumental, but has rich details. One of the notable monuments of the city, the Ignacio Ramirez Cultural Center, or National Fine Art Institute, is a cultural center installed in a former convent of the Sisters of the Immaculate Conception, built in 1775. The convent was closed in the 19th century and remained unoccupied until the middle of the 20th. Around its central fountain, the two-story cloister with its large passageways is surrounded by a large courtyard. Today, the complex holds a museum, an auditorium, two art galleries, and a restaurant. One of the rooms is dedicated to a mural by David Alfaro Siquieros, Pedro Martinez, and Eleanor Cohen, painted with students from the school. In the 19th century, after the War of Independence, and in the early 20th, San Miguel de Allende had faded from memory and was on the point of becoming a ghost town. And this is when these colonial buildings were rediscovered by foreign artists, who found the calm needed for their creations here. That gave the city a new reputation, which attracted other artists, Mexicans and foreigners, then tourists and retirees, who picked up the economy of the sleeping city. Today, a large part of the economy of the municipality is tied to the influx of tourists and foreigners who represent the near totality of its revenue. Another remarkable building is the San Miguel Archangel Parish Church. Unique in Mexico, it is the emblem of the city. Its neo-Gothic facade was reconstructed in 1880 by Zeferino Gutierrez, a local self-taught architect who freely took inspiration from European Gothic models, thanks to postcards and lithographs. The original church, built at the end of the 18th century, was a traditional Mexican design. It is richly decorated with statues, frescoes, and paintings by the famous painter Juan Rodriguez Juarez. It is understandably one of the most photographed churches in the country.
The construction of the San Francisco church began in 1778 and was finished 20 years later when the popular architectural styles were changing. Its facade could be pure Churigaresque style, while its bell tower is neoclassical. Those who enjoy architectural classifications will find quite a challenge here. Some say the facade is Churigaresque, others that it is Baroque or even Rococo. Or finally, a combination of them all, with its slender columns and multiple sculptures carved in stone. The most spectacular work is certainly the crucifixion of Christ at the summit. The art of sculpted stone certainly reached its high point here, around the entrance to this church. The interior reveals, in a blend of Ionic and Corinthian styles, a strictness in the plans initiated by the straight lines of the façade, which continues to the altarpiece in the back, where the main altar is located. The San Francisco church is truly a jewel that greatly enriches the heritage of San Miguel de Allende. This ancient colonial city in the north of Mexico is now, since 2008, listed as a World Heritage Site, both for its Baroque and Neo-Gothic architecture and its leading role in the Mexican War of Independence. In Beijing, the Temple of Heaven is considered as the peak of traditional Chinese architecture. At the time, the Emperor was considered as the Son of Heaven, charged with forming a link between the heavenly authority and order on Earth. Completed in 1420, it was rebuilt and renamed Temple of Heaven in 1530. It's a major complex located at the heart of the city, and it contains many temples, including the Hall of Prayer for Good Harvests, a circular building topped with a conical roof. The hall rises 38 meters high over three floors. With a radius of 18 meters, it was built entirely of wood without using the slightest nail. This building is the symbol of tourism in China, and its picture can be seen everywhere with its triple roof of blue tiles. It is richly decorated inside. In the center, the big four columns symbolize the four seasons, and the twelve others symbolize the twelve months of the year. The emperor would come here once a year during the ceremonies devoted to the heavens for good harvests. Here, the emperor would pray for good harvests. Built so as to offer sacrifices to the gods, the Temple of Heaven contains many annexes, like the Imperial Vault of Heaven, in which the divinities of lower rank were worshipped. They are the divinities of the sun, the moon, and stars, as well as the rain, thunder, and lightning. The blue tiles symbolize the sky. In order to show respect, the sacrificial ceremonies celebrated by the emperor at the winter and summer solstices were very important, and each building annex had a role to play. To access the rest of the site, you must cross the Gate of Prayer for Good Harvests, which is also richly decked. It gives out onto the Sacred Imperial Way, running 400 meters, 25 meters wide.
it runs to another gate with arches of varying size. The central arch, the greatest, is devoted to God. Here we are in the courtyard of the Imperial Vault. At its center and at the peak of the circular mound, the octagonal building was built in the same period and following the same proportions as the Hall of Prayer for Good Harvests. This is where the emperor had the sacrificial animals blessed prior to the ceremony. And he would consult the calendar tablets of heaven. The imperial vault of heaven is flanked by two buildings. The one to the east is devoted to Yang, to the divinities of the sun, the north star, and the planets. It contains very beautiful paintings. The tablets of heaven and of deceased emperors were kept in the imperial vault of heaven. The one to the west is devoted to Yin, to the divinities of the moon, clouds, and rain. It also displays a double row of beautiful polychromatic beams. The imperial vault of heaven is completely surrounded by a round enclosure, which also symbolizes heaven. To the south lies the altar of heaven. It is a circular space surrounded by a balustrade comprised of 360 pillars, symbolizing the 360 days of the old Chinese lunar year. The Altar of Heaven, devoted to sacrifices, looks like the terrace in the Hall of Prayers for Good Harvests, with its three levels made of marble, but without its round building. The Emperor would celebrate the ceremonial made up of sacrificial animals, alcohol, jade tablets, and silk by prosterning himself. The imperial throne was placed in the center of the platform to symbolize the role of the sovereign as the Son of Heaven and as a link between the divinities and earth. This site was considered as the center of the universe. In Beijing, the Temple of Heaven is indeed a site loaded with symbols. Fifteen kilometers from Cusco, the Urumbamba Valley stretches out in front of us. Named El Valle Sagrado, the sacred valley is very fertile and densely populated. Within the valley is the site of Pisac, 
made up of two distinct parts, the village beside the river and the Inca ruins perched on a rocky peak. This part of Pisac, Kinchirake, was undoubtedly a garrison post, a fortified stronghold with battlements, which provided refuge for the population in times of attack. On the hillside opposite, you can see some excavations dug into the cliff. That is the site of a massive Inca cemetery, but the tombs were plundered many years ago. Pisac is famous for its agricultural terraces, which spread out in elegant curves over the southern and eastern slopes of the mountain. Under the watchful eye of the ruins of the fortified town, the Inca terraces are still in regular use today. At the top of the site is the ceremonial sector, composed of a special monument, the Intihuatana, several canals, still in working order, and a number of well-preserved temples. At the center of the circular sun temple is the Intihuatana, a sort of sculpted calendar which represented the connection between men and the sun god. Around it are a group of smaller stone temples whose walls contain a series of niches which would once have held idols or other sacred objects. Further down the sacred valley, Salinas de Maras is a collection of small bowl-shaped terraces dug out of the mountainsides by the pre-Inca peoples. They were, and still are, used to collect pools of salt water from an underground source, which then dries out in the dry season, leaving a layer of shining white crystallized salt. The salt is harvested with a long rake, just like in the salt marshes in Europe. The villagers have formed a cooperative. Each family has a plot of two or three terraces, and they sell their harvest to the commune, which exports the salt around the country. Seen from above, the terraces form a magnificent ochre, brown, and white mosaic. Seven kilometers away from the salt pools on the Altiplano, at 3,500 meters above sea level, the terraces of Moray, dug out to form this deep amphitheater, are an incredible sight. Discovered in 1930, the Moray archaeological site is made up of concentric terraces rising over different levels, all cut into a huge clay basin. Each level appears to have a unique microclimate depending on its depth. Each layer is made up of a terrace, distinctive in its dimensions and layout, and the deepest of the terraces reaches down to 150 meters below the rim. The Incas used this site as an agronomical laboratory, conducting experiments to determine the optimal conditions for each of their agricultural crops. The differences in temperature and humidity between each layer enabled them to test plant growth according to climate and altitude. Further along the valley, the formidable fortress of Olantaytambo was an important religious and military center for the Incas. At the top of the terraces is a ceremonial temple. The stones come from a mine in the mountainside six kilometers above the riverbank on the far side of the Urumbamba. It must have taken thousands of workers to transport these enormous blocks from the mine to the site. One of the rare occasions when the conquistadors lost a major battle was on one of these immense steep terraces which surround the Inca ruins. It was to this fortress that Manco Inca withdrew after the fall of Cusco. In 1536, the conquistador Hernando Pizarro came with cavalrymen and large numbers of Indian and Spanish infantry to capture the Inca, under the deluge of arrows, spears, and stones which rained down on them from the terraces above, Pizarro's men were unable to climb up to the fortress. The horses got bogged down in the water on the plain, and Pizarro gave the order to retreat. The men were soon fleeing from thousands of Inca warriors who had decided to pursue the conquistador down the valley. The town of Chinchero guards the entrance into the sacred valley. Here, daily life rolls on with a tranquil calm. 
Peru is full of traditional crafts. Their primary speciality is weaving apaca wool. They make ponchos, carpets, and belts with the typical Peruvian bright colors and motifs. The Chanchero Indians, grouped together into associations, work with the llama wool, which they wash with tree roots. They dye the balls of wool by soaking them in vegetable or cochineal dyes. Next comes the long process of hand weaving. Here too, the terraces were used by the Incas to produce the corn needed for the ceremonial beer, but they also grew potatoes, quinoa, broad beans, green beans, tomatoes, cocoa, coffee, and avocados. At that time, most of these fruits and vegetables were still unheard of in the West. And of course, there's also a temple, small but monumental, for worshiping the gods. The Incas were certainly the world's greatest experts in lithic architecture. On the site of Giza, the different sections of the Memphis necropolis, the ancient capital of the empire in southern Cairo, are today named after the villages that follow from the base of the plateau. The Saqqara Cemetery is the oldest part. This is where the very first stone construction appeared around 2765 BC, the Pyramid of the Pharaoh Djoser. It was constructed long before that of Cheops. The Pyramid of Djoser marked a major evolution in monumental architecture. Indeed, for the first time and after many modifications, the pharaoh's tomb took the form of a pyramid. This innovation marks the birth of a new type of sepulcher. The pyramid also underwent successive changes before achieving its final form. It is the result of many hesitations, transformations and innovations, both technical and intellectual. It was the architect Imhotep who conceived this masterpiece of the ancient Egyptian empire. The funeral complex of Djoser is the largest ever constructed in Egypt. It is made up of, among other things, a steppe pyramid and many cult edifices, a palatial temple, a serdab and chapels, pavilions, storerooms, and an enormous wall surrounding the ensemble of constructions that spreads out over 15 hectares. The wall has just one entrance at its southeast angle, but 14 false doors. The main entrance, a narrow passage just one meter wide, leads to a long corridor. Its side walls are decorated with 20 false colonnades imitating bundles of plant stems, 6.6 .6 meters high. They are not real supporting columns though. The straight passageway lined with two freestanding columns leads to a hypostyle hall, which then leads to the large courtyard running north-south. The large courtyard is lined on the south with a facade on which is a frieze of female cobras, the symbol of the monarchy and the representation of the power, both protective and destructive, of the pharaoh. The two houses built at the base of the pyramid represent the sanctuaries of Upper and Lower Egypt their decorative elements distinguish one from the other. The southern house possesses proto-Doric capitals, now three meters, but once 12 meters high. It has a kakeru frieze at its top, showing bundled sticks knotted together that were used in the construction of houses. The northern house has a primitive Doric-style facade. 
the capital's top columns decorated with papyrus flowers. The stone wall of Serdab, placed before the pyramid, has two holes on its northern side. It protects a copy of a painted human-sized statue of the deceased pharaoh. It is from here he can see and receive his gifts while staring at the stars. A 28-meter deep well, starting at the base of the Wall of Cobras, leads to the southern tomb of Djoser, a sepulcher whose underground is a copy of the Steppe Pyramid's infrastructures. A long passageway, today in open air, goes down to a granite cave leading to chambers and three storerooms. The Europeans and the Egyptians who continue to dig in the earth of Saqqara find many tombs that had yet to be uncovered. The Mastaba of Irukapta, or the Tomb of the Butchers, is at the foot of the path and dates from the 5th dynasty. Irukapta was the head of the roads to the slaughterhouses, or the king's butcher. His sepulchre is known for its line of statues in the first hall before the funeral chambers. The eight statues represent the family of the deceased. The pathway of Una, 700 meters long and 6.7 meters wide, formed a tunnel lit by the ingenious idea of not having the platform slabs touch. There is a slit of 20 centimeters running the length of it. It was protected by two side walls three meters high that supported a ceiling painted blue and decorated with yellow stars to resemble the sky. Entrances like this one appear along the causeway. The privilege to be able to be buried next to one's master was the best way of showing one's success in Egyptian society of the day. The king is at the center of everything, and from his imposing monument, he dominates over the vast necropolis conceived in the image of the court. The better a sepulcher is seen from the royal pyramid, the higher the rank. And the courtesans wanted to continue their service to their sovereign in their afterlives. The mastaba of the king's manicurists, Nyanknum and Knumontep, is a very unique tomb, dedicated to two people. But what is their connection? On each side of the door are the names of the owners of the tomb. To the left is the royal manicurist Knumontep, and to the right Nyanknum. The two men were also priests, leading the cult of Ra at the sun temple of the pharaoh. Numoptep and Yanknum are holding hands. Their attitude shows the closeness of their relationship. It is widely believed that they were brothers. A full life is shown here on these walls, like an amazing documentary. In the Middle Empire, when the pharaoh was distanced from his court, first at Thebes and then at Fayum, the necropolis was somewhat neglected. At Death Valley Junction, one of the entries to Death Valley, a cabaret run by a former dancer unexpectedly creates the transition between civilization and desert. Death Valley is distinguished by its dramatic beauty and the great purity of its landscapes. Bordered by the Panamint and Amargosa mountain ranges, a little over 10,000 years ago, Death Valley was almost entirely covered by a great lake. Fed by three rivers and numerous streams, 
the lake disappeared due to evaporation at the end of the Ice Age. Protected by the mountains, it only rains here very rarely, but fiercely. The water rushes down the slopes, tearing loose rocks and sand, and digging narrow canyons and channels. Zabrisky Point offers a spectacular view over all of the furrowed hills with changing colors. When it evaporates, the water leaves behind a thick deposit of mud, brine, and borax that was once mined. In this corridor that has virtually no humidity, where a dry and burning air circulates, the weather is scorching in the summer. It can reach 57 degrees Celsius in the shade. In the center of the valley, a stunning green spot surges from the completely naked landscape. Furnace Creek is an obligatory stop for those who wish to explore the valley. There are remnants from the time when they mined borax, which was used in the manufacture of glass and metalworking. In this oasis, there's an information center for tourists, a gas station, a bar, a cafeteria, and a post office. And in the center of a superb pine grove, two hotels and a golf course. This improbable corner of vegetation must have overjoyed the people who first discovered Death Valley in 1849. Indeed, a group of pioneers ventured into the desert without knowing its pitfalls. A hundred men, women, and children were surprised by the extreme weather conditions and were forced to abandon their 25 wagons and sacrifice their horses to feed themselves and survive. Captain Culverwell left on his own towards the south to look for help, but he died on the way. For the others, it was a month of hell that earned the valley its sinister name. Devil's Golf Course is a muddy, salty area of lumps that formed when the salt crystallized, making for a jagged, chaotic landscape. Truly a diabolical golf course. Despite this great desolation, Indians still survived here during the conquest of the West in the 19th century. They lived by gathering seeds from desert plants, sheltered in their huts made of undergrowth. Now we come to the lowest point on the North American continent, situated at 86 meters below sea level. This is Badwater Basin. The floor of the valley is carpeted with tiny pieces of salt that lock together to form regular tiny mirrors that sparkle in the sun. This depot was created over several thousand years with the retreat of the lake. Against all odds, the desert of Death Valley is covered with flowers every spring because water, invisible, is present everywhere in the subsoil and makes it possible for plant and animal life to survive. And in the middle of this desert, luxury. Thanks to the state of Nevada's liberal gaming laws, Las Vegas has become famous worldwide for its casinos. The city is a first-rate tourist destination, welcoming around 40 million visitors per year, thanks to the enormous hotel capacity of the city. The hotel, Caesar's Palace, is inspired by a Roman theme. It has 3,349 rooms spread over five towers and holds 20 restaurants. It was the mecca of boxing and games of chance. The Bellagio is a luxury hotel that has 3,933 rooms and 512 suites. The night of its opening, its casino earned $88 million. The Paris Las Vegas has 4,200 employees at the service of its clientele. 
Built on the model of Parisian symbols, it offers the good taste of the French, but in a disproportionate style. The architecture of the New York Hotel is meant to evoke the American megacity. It includes several towers like the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building. The Statue of Liberty, 46 meters high, overlooks the Brooklyn Bridge. It only has 2,000 rooms. The Excalibur opened its doors in 1990, and with its 4,000 rooms, it was the largest hotel in the world until 1993. It is one of the first hotels to have offered activities for children. The MGM Grand Las Vegas is the largest today. It has over 5,000 rooms, and its architecture is some of the most imposing in Las Vegas. The MGM holds one of the biggest casinos in the city, with its 16,000 square meters and its 3,000 slot machines. Enough to make the lion of Metro Goldwyn Mayer roar with pleasure.